to uh, this year's uh, Anna McPherson lecture hosted by the McGill Department of Physics. Um, this is a, a special endowed lecture um, with name for Anna McPherson. Um, she was a Canadian physicist and the first female professor in the physics department at McGill. Um, she was actually also an alumna of McGill. She got her um, undergraduate degree from McGill, um, where she won the Anne Wilson Gold Medal for Excellence, which is given to the best uh, student in physical sciences. Um, she then got a degree from McGill and then uh, her PhD from the University of Chicago. Um, but because this was the 1930s and because of sexism, um, she had a long and circuitous path back to her alma mater, where she ultimately became a professor um, after many, many years of trying. Um, and again, because of uh, sexism, she was given a heavier teaching load, um, but she was widely regarded as a, a staple in the department, an excellent educator, and a conquered debt. Um, she actually donated a large sum of money to the university to go towards civics research, and that's in part uh, where the endowment for this lecture series comes from. So it's a really special event um, put on uh, by the department every year to honor Anna McPherson uh, and her legacy. And um, we're so pleased to welcome this year's Anna McPherson to our lecture. Uh, so we're very pleased to have Dr. Francis Salton. Um, I, I was told to keep his introduction very short so he can tell you about the site. So I'll just be brief. Um, currently, he is the um, Hilda and Gregory Bright Distinguished Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he is also the director of the Institute of Elementary Particle Physics. Um, notably, he is the principal investigator of the Ice Cube Experiment, which is the largest neutrino experiment and observatory in the world. And Knight is going to tell us all about uh, his endeavors and that experiment, and so let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Francis Halton. Okay, are you ready for this? <laughs> uh, this is a wild ride. I have to explain all these things to you. What's a neutrino? What's neutrino astronomy? What's ice cube? And then I'll tell you a little bit what happened after these three subjects. Uh, if you don't know what a neutrino is, it's uh, rather easy to explain. And you know, if you give the stage to a university professor, he's going to give you a lecture, right? So get ready. Uh, do you remember what the world is made of? It's made of protons and neutrons that make nuclei, and then you put atoms around it, and you get at, uh, electrons around it, and you get atoms. Well, that's not the whole story, because uh, in the 1930s, people noticed uh, that a neutron can actually decay. It lives a certain time, it's not stable. And they noticed when the neutron decays into a proton and an electron, then occasionally a proton and an electron would go in the same direction if I'm the neutron. That violates high school physics, right? If I'm the neutron, the proton goes this way, the electron has to go that way. And they notice this is not always the case. And so what happens is that there is a particle that you don't see, but that's emitted toward the back and that balances the energy and the momentum in the event. And you literally don't see the particle. That's why the neutrino is often referred to as the ghost particle. And this is a perfect discovery of the neutrino in uh, uh, Cambridge in 1933, uh, except, you know, only three particles existed. They couldn't believe they had discovered a fourth one. And so Pauli was the one who actually suggested that this has to be a real particle. You cannot give up basic laws of physics. And uh, so Alice and Mott did this experiment and discovered the neutron, the, the neutrino. So that's not the answer, this is the answer. And in fact, there are more neutrinos in the universe than any of the three other particles. So it's the most common one. And so uh, you have to kind of think of the neutrino, which is this particle Pauli invented to make the changes from neutrons to protons possible. Changing neutrons into protons is what we today call nuclear physics. 
So neutrinos are essential to make any nuclear physics possible. So without neutrinos, there would have been no Big Bang. The sun wouldn't shine, stars wouldn't explode. And these are three reasons why we wouldn't be here tonight. So neutrinos are pretty important. We make neutrinos at Fermilab in Chicago with accelerator beams. You emit neutrinos, quite a lot of them, from the salt that is integrated in your, in your body. And this is the important picture here. Remember that this is a nuclear reactor which is covered with water. And uh, the water is blue. The reason the water is blue is that the nuclear reactor emits electrons, protons, and other things. And you want to shield yourself from the radiation. But remember, a charged particle going to water calls it blue. That will be very important for my subject tonight. Uh, this is another important place where neutrinos are produced. The universe is filled with cosmic rays. We know that since uh, 1912, more than 100 years ago. We don't know where they come from. This is the topic of this talk. But we know for a long time that when they enter the atmosphere, they inter make a nuclear reaction with the nitrogen and the oxygen in the atmosphere and makes neutrinos. So if you look up at the atmosphere, the atmosphere produces neutrinos all the time. And that will play a role in this talk as well. So what's neutrino astronomy? Well, that is uh, a topic. What's astronomy? I'm a physicist. So that's astronomy. That's the universe in some kind of a projection. This ellipse describes what you see in the sky. And you see this band of light along the major axis. That's the galactic plane. That's the Milky Way. And so the way you see the sky is you see the Milky Way, which are the stars in your own galaxy. And then there are many galaxies far away that make the universe, but they are much farther away. And so they are just uh, small dots like this one, maybe, uh, in the sky. You see here, and it's normal. The stars in your own galaxy dominate. You see them first. Now, astronomers uh, invented this great tool that if you change the color of light uh, from the one you from the light you see with your eyes, for instance, if I go towards redder light, this is actually microwave light. Uh, you see a different, you see different things. This is the microwave background. It reminds us that uh, there are throughout the universe, including this room, for every cubic centimeter, there are 411 microwave photons. And that was a great discovery, which you cannot make with your eyes. If you go to the blue, the universe looks like this. You see again our own galaxy. But now we are in the blue, and we think of these not as light waves, but as photons. This is quantum mechanics, so these are like particles to us. And you see, again, tiny dots that are faraway galaxies in our own Milky Way. So this works so well that you try to go to even shorter wavelengths of bluer light or higher energy photons. And if you try to do that, the universe looks like this. You see nothing. So there is an end to this game. And the person who eventually get the credit for discovering the neutrinos told me one day, as soon as they discovered the neutrino, everybody thought of doing astronomy with it. So <laughs> there's no, no uh, credit for this. So this is another way of looking at the problem. You see, that's, uh, I'm sorry, this is a complicated plot, but it's a useful one too for this purpose. It tells you how much light at each, at certain wavelengths, certain color, certain energies of the photons you will receive from the universe. And you see the light, most of the light comes from the microwave background, CMB here, this peak. 
there is some radio light reaching us. And then here you see the visible light. There is infrared there, ultraviolet. And you see, then you go to these high energy photons, very sh short wavelength, and you see the sky turns black. That's the thing I mentioned before. And so the idea is, well, we can do neutrino physics there. We can do physics with neutrinos. So a little bit of an explanation for that. Why does the, 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 the sky turn black? Well, simply because a photon that's emitted very far away in a galaxy, it will never reach your telescope. It will meet one of the 411 per cubic centimeter and makes an E plus E minus pair, an electron positron pair. And once you have charged particles, you cannot do astronomy. Because like this charged particle, which may be emitted by the same galaxy, it has to travel through the magnetic field outside the galaxy. Eventually, the magnetic field we know exists inside our galaxy. And so they are bent and forget their direction. You cannot, like we do with our eyes at night, you cannot uh, trace the star straight back. So that's the problem. And that's why the sky turns black. And it's, of course, an obvious idea that neutrinos don't have that problem. Remember, there are these ghost particles. You really don't see them. They don't interact with anything, including your measuring apparatus. And they uh, can reach us from the beginning of time and from the edge of the universe. So it's uh, Disneyland for doing astronomy. The problem is that they are very difficult to detect. And that's the topic of the rest of this talk. Uh, but so again, so that's another way of looking at this. And once you reach the gamma ray sky, the sky from there on we have never seen. We know there are cosmic rays out there, these protons that swirl around. We have no idea where they come from, how they are accelerated to these enormous energies. And so, uh, but neutrinos, they are masterless. And another way of looking at it, these neutrinos are just like the particles of light. You know, they have a tiny mass, but in this talk, this is totally irrelevant. Uh, the mass is very small compared to their energy, and so we can forget about it. They are just like a photon. Okay. Uh, then you go and ask for money to do this. They say, what if there's nothing there? That's the first reaction from the funding agency. And of course, there is something there because there are somehow particle accelerators that accelerate and produce these protons that we see that we call cosmic rays. And uh, so to think about it, I, I remember in 1991, a modest experiment in Utah uh, detected a proton that had an energy of 300 million TeV. That's 100,000 times the energy of the particles that are accelerated by the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. So how does nature do this? You know, in Geneva, it takes a ring of magnets of 27 kilometers. Well, the answer is you fill the orbit of Mercury with LHC magnets and you can accelerate that particle. But that's not presumably not how nature does this. And so the game, the rest of the talk is to try to find out where these particles, where these cosmic accelerators lived and how they work, how they function. Now, there is a whole part of the history I'm going to skip because I have told you this is uh, an interesting thing to do. We look at the universe that's never been seen before. The problem is I didn't tell you how big a detector I need because I cannot detect neutrinos. Neutrinos are particles. I need a particle detector. I cannot detect them with a mirror like light. And so theorists in their wisdom over a few decades of time decided in their wisdom that uh, to have a chance you needed a particle detector that's a kilometer cube in size. And then you may be lucky. And we know how to build a neutrino detector. 
we built big ones in the Japanese Alps. What you need is water and light sensors. You see, these are like big light bulbs, but they detect light instead of emitting them. So, and the problem with this, this beautiful experiment is 10,000 more to build a kilometer cube neutrino detector. So how do you meet the challenge? And this looks impossible, but the answer was known since 1960. Is the man on the left, Markov, Moshe Markov, who at a conference in uh, New York, in Rochester, gave, made the proposal, and I won't read what he said, but uh, so the key is to take light sensors, just like in the Japanese experiment. In our case, these are like the size of a, a basketball. And uh, you put them, a lot of them, in deep ocean water. And so you imagine a kilometer cube of deep ocean water filled with light sensors. And that looks like the experiment in Japan, but you can make it a kilometer in size. And so what do you do then? Here goes is how the story goes. You look for a neutrino coming through the earth. So you don't look up, you look down. And if you detect something coming through the earth, it can only be a neutrino. That's the easy part. This neutrino, what will it do? It will go through your detector. But one in a million times at the energy range where we are working, it will find a hydrogen nucleus or an oxygen nucleus in, in the water and make a nuclear reaction with it. When you make a nuclear reaction, you create charged particles, and charged particles, unlike neutral particles, electrically neutral ones like a neutrino, when they go to water, they make blue light. Remember the picture of the nuclear reactor? And so the... the some of these particles, it doesn't matter, it's called a muon, uh, is very special because it will travel through the water for kilometers, to 10, up to 10 kilometers. And uh, it will, will emit light, but the light in water is uh, slowed down. Light in water, it, it, you know, these are enormous energies, so it practically travels at the speed of light. But the light in water travels at three quarters of the speed of light. So it's like a speedboat that goes faster than the wake it leaves behind. And from the wake of this muon, you can measure where it came from. Just like even if you don't see the speedboat, you look at the wake, you know which direction it's going. That's the concept. Here is actually uh, an example of an event. So a neutrino. This neutrino came in from 11 degrees below the horizon, so it is a neutrino. It interacted in front of the detector, made a nuclear reaction, and the muon flies through the detector making light. And you see the light, uh, you can, with your eyes, reconstruct the direction this particle is going. In fact, we can do this to 0.3 degrees, which is... Not bad, actually, but not great by uh, astronomical standards. And uh, if you don't quite get it, here is the movie. You see the particle comes in on your left and travels with the speed of light slowed down through the detector. You see you follow the colors of the rainbow. You see which way it's going. Now, each of these little dots is one of these 10 inch light sensors. And uh, so when they see light, so this, this little dot here sees one photon. And a, a big dot like this, the sensor sees 100 photons. So you see the particle came close to it. And from this information, uh, we can uh, reconstruct where the particle came from, which it remembers the direction of the neutrino, and you have a telescope. Now, this was tried off the coast of Hawaii, and uh, 
the experiment after deploying some of its uh, equipment that's in a test experiment failed. And so that's when we started developing the idea in, at the University of Wisconsin of uh, building a detector in South Pole ice rather than in Hawaiian waters. Now you would think uh, our only idea we actually had was that putting this detector, freezing it in ice, would be easier than putting it in deep ocean water. You say this is crazy. Well, it's not crazy and we were right, <laughs> uh, as history has shown. This is Antarctica. East Antarctica, you find as much ice as you can dream of. The, this is the South Pole, this hole here. And so you're standing there on uh, three kilometers of ice. In some places, the ice sheet is five kilometers deep. And uh, so the other piece of luck we had, uh, many pieces of luck, was that there is a station at the South Pole that allows to support you to build such an experiment. Here is actually the construction of Ice Cube. And this is the runway. Everything at the time came in with C-130 cargo planes. Uh, and the way this works is you build your stuff in at the University of Wisconsin. It goes to Christchurch uh, in New Zealand, either by ship or by plane. And there is a center of logistic support of uh, the National Science Foundation. Then it's a nine hour flight to McMurdo on the coast and another three hour flight to the pole. And everything goes in through the back of a C-130. So this is the South Pole. It's a three kilometer high desert. And uh, what we figured out, and it took us 10 years to figure this out, was that the ice under the South Pole and is incredible clarity. Uh, so there is actually a station in support, uh, as you can see, and it's open uh, summer and winter. So that's a picture in winter. So actually what we finally, by doing various uh, tests, found that blue light in water travels hundreds, 200, 300 meters, depending on the depth. And uh, you cannot make a solid in a lab that's that transparent to blue light. And so the reason is that this is like compacted 60,000 year old snow and it's ultra pure. And so if the light travels over long distances, you can space your light sensors over big distances. And you need only about 5,000 to fill a kilometer cube of ice. And uh, that's it. There we go. The problem is, uh, I'm a theorist. I, you know, I have no experiment, I have no experience, no experimental group. And so you think these experiments, you know, start as a big enterprise in Washington. They didn't. I uh, had a lab, which was the table tennis table. I removed it and we constructed pressure sensors with these optical sensors in it and started deploying them at the South Pole. So you see, this is a sensor that's starting a trip a kilometer down the ice. And uh, we built a small detector. There it is, 1500 meter deep, about 650 of uh, these light sensors. And uh, started first figuring out the optics of the ice and then see if we could detect neutrinos. And this was the most beautiful moment of my life. Here is a neutrino. And you see it traveled through the ice. And uh, the problem is, this is a neutrino produced in the atmosphere because we had a detector that 
by the best estimates, was a factor of 100 too small. But you see, uh, this sounds all very simple, but just, you know, it's not always this simple. And this is not me. Uh, so I, uh, what do you do? So now you know the technique works. So you, pu you publish in Nature, make all kinds of exaggerated claims, and then go to the funding agencies and ask for money. And you are held by your friends. So at the time, Scientific American declared the seven wonders of modern astronomy, and there we are. <laughs> and if you cannot read this, it says the weirdest telescope. Uh, but it did a job, and so uh, we started producing these sensors on an industrial scale, filled a kilometer cube of ice with uh, uh, 5,000 plus of these basketball uh, light bulbs. And so if you could go inside the detector, you would see these strings of uh, 60 light sensors, a kilometer long. And if you go 125 meters away, then you would see another string. And 86 of these strings of sensors fills a kilometer cube detector. Now, you can actually see the detector. Every year a plane flies over the pole that uh, maps, does radio mapping of the ice sheet. And uh, they would turn off their apparatus when they flew over ice cube. And I asked them to keep it on. And you see, you can see the detector. This is the surface of the ice here at, uh, at the top. This is the bottom where the ice is, there was the, the rock. The ice sheet is uh, supported on. And here you see the detector. And if you look carefully in the top left here, you see the Amanda detector, which was our uh, R&D project. And so to avoid all questions on this topic, how do you put photomultipliers in ice? And so the first 90 meters, so a short movie, the first 90 meters is snow. So you melt it. Then comes what we call the hot water drill, and it puts water under pressure. And it just falls by gravity. And in two days, it has melted its way down to two and a half kilometers over a volume that's large enough to contain these sensors. And so all it takes is a, a five megawatt heating plant that uh, puts out 200 gallons per minute under pressure of boiling water. And what it is in practice, it's, uh, you know, 45 car wash heaters. <laughs> and uh, here you see the equipment, it's like a circus train, but it's on sleds. So you see the drill tower. This is a marvel of technology. It's a hose that big, that's two and a half kilometer long and shoots its way down to two and a half kilometers uh, without interruption. So here you see, these are the generators that uh, produce uh, the boiling water, the, the 4.8 megawatts. And so after two days, you have transformed ice into water over a depth of two and a half kilometer. You pull the hot water drill out, you will see the nozzle. It's just the nozzle that, you know, the, the shape of the nozzle is actually critical. And then you move 80, 125 meters away, start again, do this 86 times, and you're finished. So ice is uh, insulated, so that water remains liquid actually for a long time. And so you can you have time like we can on 30 hours to deploy your equipment. So this is the electric cable that brings down the voltage to your equipment. And also it brings back the digitized signals of light seen by each of these sensors. So that's it. And then you take data. What we didn't know is that this is a turned out to be an ex extremely efficient technology. And once you have this, your experiment deployed, it's absolutely stable. 
In the last 15 years, we have lost five than five, less than five of these senses. We actually lost five, but we re one of them was we revived one that had been dead for uh, many years. But you see here a picture. So in Antarctic summer, which is December, January, you have the time to about to deploy about uh, 20 of these uh, strings. And so it takes about five years to build a kilometer cube detector. These strings go, go in these two story buildings, which is filled with computers. And so if you go into this building, that's what you see. So then you turn this experiment on and what do you see? Uh, you know what you see, you see the atmosphere. Remember, the atmosphere produces neutrinos, and not just neutrinos, it produces these muon particles. And they have nothing to do with the problem you're trying to solve, looking at the universe. And uh, so this is the detector taking data. You see what it does, it continuously catches these tracks and reconstructs them. And in fact, this move is, you see the move repeat, it's 10 milliseconds long. So what this means is that from the atmosphere, we see 100 billion muons every year, 3,000 per second. We see one neutrino about every four to five minutes, 100,000 per year. These are interested for neutrino physics, but that's a different talk. And then we see, basically, we didn't know but we ended up seeing one or two cosmic neutrinos uh, for, uh, no, this per year, about 10 cosmic neutrinos per year, or actually about 10 we are sure of their cosmic neutrinos. So at this point, we start taking data, and I must say the elation of, may, of seeing that uh, the method works and building the detector got a bit of a beating when uh, new scientists put out this web page. I'm not making this up. It allowed you to bet on the probability that big experiments would make a discovery. And you see uh, the, LA, the, the Large Hadron Collider discovering the Higgs was giving one in six. We discovering cosmic neutrinos was also one in six. Uh, Actually, LIGO discovering gra gravitational wave, you could bet one in 500. Mm -hmm. And we all started betting on LIGO and they put the page down. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, you know, I, it was a shock that, you know, you finally realize that you're not sure this will pay off. And uh, then suddenly we found this event. And you see that changed everything. This event, the neutrino actually interacts inside the detector. This was not totally unanticipated. And you see there is no track. Actually, there besides these events producing muons, there are neutrino events producing electrons and tau neutrinos. It's a detail, but they look like that. And you see we can measure, we contain the energy. We know exactly what the energy of the neutrino is. It's uh, a million times the energy of the neutrinos we produce at Fermilab in Chicago. There's no way the atmosphere could do this. And that was it. We were actually looking for something totally different. But then the question came, well, maybe there are more of these events. And so we analyzed the first two years of data. By the way, now I'm going to, you have to, you, you don't have to, don't forget what you're looking at. Uh, this is the event superimposed on the Ice Cube data center in Madison. This is like six city blocks. And this event has uh, 300,000 photons in it. So there's a lot of information over a huge distance. So it makes this possible. So we ran over the first two years of data and found 28 events like this. And that represented uh, the discovery of cosmic neutrinos. We published in science, and three weeks later, we were uh, declared the breakthrough of the year in physics. 
And after that, I didn't sleep for a long time. <laughs> it's true, you know, I'm not joking. So, uh, but it turns out, I mean, we, we now see this flux in five, six different ways, all above, uh, always uh, total statistical certainty. So, but now the question was, where do these particles come from? Now we finally have neutrinos. We could point them back at the cosmic accelerators that produce these incredible events. Uh, and so you make a sky map, remember? This is the sky in neutrinos. And I can only show you one year of data because of the resolution of PowerPoint. These are 138,000 neutrinos detected in one year. And uh, But then if you fish out the very high energy events, like I showed you a few before, then we come up with 12 events per year. And so that's what we have to do our physics with eventually. Now notice the first thing, there is no galactic plane. That does not make sense. And so this was a worry. Uh, we see only far away galaxies. We don't see our own. And that was a worry. In fact, here is a map that contains 186 neutrinos, 86, 66, whatever. And you see there's no sign of our own galaxy. And in fact, if you look at this picture, remember, these are the photons in the sky here. The flux we measure, this was an early measurement of our flux. There are actually more neutrinos in the sky than there are photons. And this was a real surprise. Of course, that's why we found it in two years. And uh, you know, neutrino physics and cosmic rays was supposed to be some boutique part of astronomy. Well, no, neutrinos and protons, cosmic rays, dominate the extreme uh, universe. And so now the question is, well, where do they come from? And uh, so I think I said all this already. So after 10 years, we started analyzing this picture and the hottest spot in the sky, so what, what you're looking at is, we look at each point on this map and ask the question, are there more neutrinos coming from that point? And do they have on average higher energy? That's a neutrino star, right? And so here it is. We found this hotspot and the probability that it was produced by background is about one in a thousand. That's what physicists refer to as 2.9 sigma. And that's just not enough to be credible. So what do you do? This is 10 years of data. Another 10 years of data is not going to change this significantly. And so you have to make a better detector. And I'm going to skip this slide, basically. Uh, we did make a better detector. We improved all the techniques we were using we made the geometry better, we calibrated the sensors better, and uh, then there was this magic thing that sh showed up a few years ago called machine learning, and that was it. Uh, in fact, we by machine learning, we found the galactic plane. This is a propaganda picture, but you see the galactic plane is red. You have seen it many times in these slides, right? It's superimposed on the galactic plane you see from the South Pole. And uh, it's there at a the 10% level. It doesn't stand out. So it's still a puzzle. It means there are sources of neutrinos in other galaxies that don't exist in our own. And I think that by the end of the talk, I have an idea what this is. So here is the data with the better detector. And... Uh, so the hotspot is there again. And then we also look through a catalog of sources and we find it again. And uh, the local significance, the excess on this map is five sigma. And that's kind of the gold standard. But we actually have a method where you can 
count all your trials and the probability that this is uh, an accidental uh, statistical fluctuation is like one in a hundred thousand. So this is real. What is it? It's an active galaxy. You know what a galaxy is? It's like ours. It's, you know, a matter going in a, around the black hole. And uh, an active galaxy, unlike ours, the black hole is cannibalizing, is all its own galaxy. So stars, gas, light falls into this black hole. And uh, you see it has, uh, this is a blow up of the black hole. Uh, and uh, we point at this black hole to uh, very high, to, to precision that's higher than our angular resolution actually. And you see here how we, how you see an excess of neutrinos from that point, there are 80 neutrinos above the background. And that makes this signal. Uh, we then started to look at other sources and we found another source, uh, NGC 4151. By the way, these phone numbers mean it's the, what's it called, the new, general catalog source. And then with that number, you can go and look and you find the coordinates in the sky of that. And so this is in, these are both nearby active galaxies. And in fact, they were first discovered as extremely luminous and rotating by Seifert in 1943. And he found a list of what's now called Seifert galaxies and the two top ones in the list were these two galaxies. So history just repeats itself. And in fact, we are now finding evidence for more and more of them, including one in the Southern hem Hemisphere called Circinus. So what is this? What, what's special about these active galaxies? Well, you can imagine, so you have this whirlpool of matter falling in, Falling, of course, Seifert had no idea this was a black hole. This came decades later. They were just puzzled by the amount of energy coming out. And it was only later, you know, black holes are now, you know, not any different from the screen. There are three of us, the screen and this computer for us. And uh, theories were fascinating with these jets of particles they produce, and so are astronomers. But from our data, these miserable 80 events, we actually figured out that, first of all, you know, particles falling in a black hole can be accelerated in many ways. I won't go into this. But they are accelerated. If they are accelerated close to, of it to the black hole, this is a very high dense region where they can interact with light and matter and produce neutrinos, just like at Fermilab. You need a beam and a target. And so this was perfectly the source you could imagine to produce neutrinos. And so all the sources we find evidence for, all means five or six by now, I didn't count, uh, they are all like this. So uh, this is another way to look at it. And from the amount of neutrinos we see, we can kind of tell how close to the black hole they must have been produced because uh, the astronomers telling, tell us how dense the source is. And in fact, these neutrinos are produced roughly within 10 to 100 Schwarzschild radii. Now, if you don't know what a Schwarzschild radii, radius is, this is one and a half Schwarzschild radii. This is the famous picture of the black hole. So this is our places in the galaxy that are practically impossible to reach, except with, you know, coupling a large number of radio telescopes. Now we have 80 neutrinos. That's, you know, it's a start. We already figured out where they originated. So. In fact, the, the biggest signal was from these three sources. And uh, so these three sources uh, combined give you the biggest signal in the sky. 
And one of these sources we had already discovered before. This kind of clinched the whole deal. We actually did the following. When we detected an interesting neutrino, a high energy neutrino, we would reconstruct it. And for instance, this one, 43 seconds after the light passed the ice, the reconstruction was sent to every telescope in the world. And then this way we figured out that uh, it came from a source called TXS0506. It's again one of these galaxies I described before. And uh, it actually was a team, an emitter of TV, high, very high energy gamma rays. And so this was uh, kind of you know, not very definite, but remember, this is the second observation of this source. We didn't actually know whether astronomers paid attention, but in fact, at some point, more than 20 telescopes were looking at this source. And uh, the interesting one we only found out about recently, there was an optical telescope who was on that source 73 seconds, I, yes, 73 seconds, after we emitted the alert. And two hours later, it makes a huge optical flash. Now, they had been looking at the source for 12 years. It had never done anything. But two hours after the neutrino, it did something. Usually, these flashes have to do with an arrangement at the center of the galaxy or so. And that, that was a definite discovery. In fact, they only announced it later because they ran their telescope on this source continuously for two and a half years to make sure it didn't happen by accident or they hadn't missed it before. So uh, I think the question now is, have we solved the cosmic ray problem? Well, if you had to bet your wallet, you would see active galaxies, right? And it makes sense because remember, our own galaxy isn't active. And so that's why we don't see our own galaxy. We see preferentially the active galaxies other than our own. So it kind of begins to fit together. But, uh, you know, cosmic ray physics is never this simple. <laughs> this is a preliminary solution. And so what we clearly need now is more than 80 events. We need detectors that are 10 times, 30 times bigger. They are all being conceived, including one in Canada, of the west coast of Vancouver uh, called P1, uh, which is being built by some of our, our own collaborators. And uh, in fact, Ice Cube has a growing group in Canada, uh, Alberta, Simon Fraser, and Queen's University are all part of Ice Cube. And uh, so the future uh, is, uh, more telescopes, better telescopes, better pointing. And I didn't do this work by myself. And that's how it's usually shown to you. These are the young people that brought us machine learning. And that's uh, why, you know, we finally start to deliver some insight on the origin of the cosmic rays after one century. Thank you very much. So now we have some time for questions from the audience. What's the proper thing? Yes. Uh, I didn't, I skipped that part. This is still, uh, it's still being debated. This, uh, so there are two what a so to produce neutrinos, you need an accelerated proton, a cosmic ray of high energy, and you need a target. The target is clear. Astronomers know how dense and how much target there is close to the black hole. That you just look up in publications. How are the protons accelerated? 
And there are many possibilities. When this matter falls into the black hole, you can accelerate the protons by shocks. That's an old idea. But the so-called accretion disk, this swirl of matter, on this disk, there are turbulent magnetic fields as well. And you can accelerate protons there. And this is the kind of the preferred model, but that's theory. But the, the you know, this is, it's the place where you expect to be able to accelerate high energy particles, right? It's, but how this happened in detail now is for us to figure out. And there are only two ways that we should get more neutrinos, and we will. We have proposed, we have a detailed plan to build a 10 times bigger telescope around Ice Cube. And, uh, uh, the other way is to make uh, a radio picture, uh, just like the black hole that I showed the picture of, to do a campaign like that on the galaxy, on, on one of the, the galaxies we have identified as uh, cosmic ray sources, and that's being debated as well. So now, the you know, that's science, right? You you solve something, now you ask harder questions. And so you need more information. That's how it goes. Are they just bigger black holes? Hmm? Are they bigger black holes? Ah, yeah, they, yes. These are uh, the black hole in the galaxy of NGC 1068 is more than uh, uh, 10 million solar masses. Yeah, this person had their hand up. Yeah, over here. Let's say you had a bigger budget, budget. What are some questions you really want to answer? What are your next steps? Well, that's certainly one of them. And sorry, I didn't hear the answer. Are there any other questions you think with the technology we have we could answer? Oh. That's a whole different talk. Uh, <laughs> the question is, are there other questions you can address with this equipment? In fact, only about a quarter of the people, we have a collaboration now of about 400, I think 420 people. Only about a hundred or less are doing what I talked about. All the rest are doing other things with this uh, experiment. We are uh, studying neutrino oscillations. With the 100,000 neutrinos a year, uh, we get from uh, the atmosphere. And so we are not as good an experiment as the experiments at Fermilab, but we have a lot more neutrinos. So we give them now a run for their money. And we are improving the detector to actually have hopefully in a few years, the best neutrino experiment to do neutrino physics, not to do astronomy. Uh, then, you know, there are, there are, of course, we do glaciology. And I, I won't go, this takes too long. I'll give you one example. We can actually now do tomography of the Earth. And so we begin to see whether a neutrino passed through the core of the Earth or through the mantle. And so we, we are set to eventually map the interior of the Earth. And we are not telling the geologists anything they don't know, but this is the first time that the core of the Earth has seen that by a direct technique, not by Fourier analysis of surface waves. So they are very excited about this. And so, uh, I, of course, if you have uh, neutrinos of this energy, you can do all kinds of neutrino physics. In fact, we are a bit in the situation of the LHC. You would think by this time that we would have found something about neutrinos that looks weird. That, but the standard model of neutrino physics explains everything we are doing. So it's a bit like the Large Hadron Collider. Where is the physics beyond the standard model? It seems to, it holds up in our case as well.
Yeah, I thank you for a fascinating talk. The half a dozen localized sources that you've seen are presumably relatively <laughs> close cosmologically. Not all, two are farther away. So my question is whether your uh, your machine in Antarctica sees any evidence of a diffuse cosmological background of neutrinos. Yeah, uh, we do. We do. Of course, the, that's the thing we saw first. We saw no sources. We just saw neutrinos. We didn't even see our, our own galaxy. So by definition, this is a diffuse flux covering the and most of our flux is still diffuse. And with this, and now you don't know whether this. My guess is that you build a ten times bigger detector, you will see more sources, and so that is diffuse flux. Is really sources you cannot separate, you don't detect. But that we don't know until, and that's true, like it's true for X rays, which is an astronomy that existed long before us, but they are still trying to separate sources from a possible diffuse background. But I think the normal assumption is that you build better telescopes, you will find more sources and. Yeah, but officially we don't know that. Is there a question here? Are there black holes that you know about that are similar to those you detected within neutrinos but are not emitting neutrinos that were in Oh, yeah, yeah. Active galaxies is a loose definition, it's about 10% of the galaxies. And uh, if you go, for instance, to the Southern Hemisphere, there is a, a source, I've forgotten the name of it, but that would be a beautiful candidate. And we looked at it and don't see any neutrinos. But it has a very strong jet, and we suspect that uh, all the light is produced in the jet, not in the core. And so astronomers don't tell us, you know, they measure the density of matter, hydrogen, and around and light around the core, the, the core, but they have not systematically done this measurement. And uh, so we are, yeah, of course, if I could tell you which galaxy emits neutrinos and which doesn't, we would have solved the cosmic ray problem completely. For instance, to pick up on the previous question, if you add up the sources we see, you get only a fraction of the total flux we see. So the rest are either unresolved sources or something else, or other sources that we haven't discovered yet. Yeah, this, you know, these are the baby steps of the field, right? So two, two short questions. Why did the deep ocean experiment fail? And why did you locate it at the south? Well, uh, the second question is easy. Uh, if NSF hadn't had that station at the pole, we could not afford to build this, especially at when you start, you don't know whether this worked. Uh, so that that's the only place it was possible. Uh, the the first question is, first of all, they didn't totally fail. A small experiment was operated for 12 years in the Mediterranean. And that kind of, uh, they are now building a detector exactly the size of Ice Cube in the Mediterranean. And of course, uh, some of the Ice Cube people are trying to build a detector supported by Canada Ocean Networks. Of, of Vancouver. And uh, so I I don't see any reason now why this wouldn't work. It's certainly a lot more difficult. You know, we started after the water experiments and you know, we now have, we for a long time have the, the only detector. 
So, yeah, this ice is incredibly forgiving. Once you freeze this photomultiplier, these sensors, and their electronics in the ice, they're totally stable. Nothing happens to them. It's like a satellite in space. In fact, we have always two people on site, and they have basically nothing to do. <laughs> these signals, uh, I hope they are not listening. <laughs> no, they, 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 they know this, uh, of course. And the, we could have built it like a satellite, but that would have been more it's cheaper to send two people to the pole over the course of a year. And uh, so, you know, software crashes or uh, you have to replace a computer or things like that. But most of the time, through, through COVID, we took the, the data come every day, about uh, 80 gigabytes, that's all, of useful data comes over the satellite to Madison. And uh, that went uninterrupted over COVID. We never knew COVID happened. It's just like telescope, uh, satellites don't. I've got a question there. Everything moves, sir. Everything moves. And the events that you look, sometimes our modeling tools in here, are just seen. They are coming from the particular. Yeah, you, well, that's fortunately, it, I laugh because we are all particle physicists. We have only one car carrying astronomer on this experiment, which happens to be a friend of mine in Madison. But fortunately, that's a problem that uh, astronomers have solved, right? You you take your... So what you have to do is you have to know exactly not just where the event uh, comes from, you have to know exactly the time it came. And then you can center... Uh, where this neutrino fits in this ellipse, right? So in fact, all our analysis is done blind. And the way we blind our analysis is not giving ourselves the time of the events. So we do the whole analysis, not actually knowing where in the sky the muons are. And then the last minute, we put the right time in, and then you see the map appear. So it guarantees that there is no bias. As we had no clue what to expect, it was not, there was not much of a bias, but still, every now, every, now that we kind of people begin to guess what to look for next, it's very important that uh, you don't know the answer until the analysis is complete. And it, not giving the an, an analyzer the time of the events is a perfect way of doing that. You can do the whole analysis, except the events are scrambled on, in the sky. And then you put the time in, and the sky suddenly disappears. Okay, thank you We have one question in the back, and we'll make this our last question. So go ahead. I've heard that using a muon particle beam it has the potential of like you could create directed neutrinos. Um, is that idea exciting to you, or is that something you'd like to see happen? Yes, uh, you can, it's called a neutrino factory. And uh, there have, this has been studied. Uh, this is, you cannot do this. It's, but you can study the neutrinos. And ne studying neutrinos is what many people at this university are doing. And it's an interesting topic all in itself. And so building a muon beam that generates neutrinos uh, is, yeah, it's a very exciting thing to do. And it's not that expensive. And it's the first step in uh, building a collider that will collide to muon beams, which is even more exciting. And so this has been talked about for decades. And this, there has lately there has been some momentum to do this. There has been this P5 panel 
is that set priorities in particle physics and they've identified this. Uh, but in the first step of building this muon collider, you get a very intense neutrino beam. And uh, that, of course, would be very useful, very exciting piece of equipment to have. How many, if there's tens of trillions of neutrinos passing through us every every second or whatever, uh, if to say it's a very intense beam, what, how intense would that really be? If you're, how many neutrinos are you creating if there's already so many? You know, these are numbers I don't know. I never mention they are meaningless, but in this case, they are not. And I don't know exact. I I don't know the answer to your question, uh, but they are very intense beams. So they are intense enough that you put a target in front of them, you would have a ton of events, right? Yeah, yeah. But I don't know the luminosity that these experiments are aiming for. I haven't followed this. In fact, this topic was very popular, disappear, and made a comeback in the last year. And I haven't had the time to, to look at it again. OK, well, um, that's all the time we had for questions. Uh, let's thank Dr. Hilton for a fantastic public lecture.